the Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey RBG International Leadership Academy. Once opened, it will be the first school in American history, 400 plus years under British North American oppression. It'll be the first school in American history built exclusively by the African diaspora. Never before in the history of our people in this country has a black independent school been built exclusively and totally with the funds from the African diaspora. We will be the first to do it. And so I'm glad to have been a part of history. Uh, we are right at the finish line of having the renovations completed for the Marcus Galvey Elementary School and the John Jacques Dessalines Nat Turner Gymnasium. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm hoping by the end of this month, we will have received all of our necessary inspections. And I'm hoping next month that we can possibly finally get our certificate of occupancy from the city of Wilmington. Um, I really can't see why we would not have it next month. Um, but once we do get it, at that point, yeah. we will decide whether we want to proceed with the community grand opening uh, for February or whether we're just going to wait until the weather breaks and do a community grand opening in April. So it's either going to be in February or it's going to be in April. Okay. And that's going to depend on when we get our final paperwork completed. Well, let me start with the requirements. Yeah. There will be no requirements for the boys. And okay. the reason there will be no requirements, except they need to be entering into one of the grades that we'll be offering, which will most likely be second, third, and fourth grade. That's the only requirement, that you be grade appropriate for entry into one of the three class levels that we will be offering. The reason there are no other admissions criteria is I don't believe in prioritizing any group of black boys above and beyond any other group of black boys. So for example, some people might say you should prioritize the boys who come from single homes. Some people might say you should prioritize the boys who don't have a father. Some people would say you should prioritize the boys who have been diagnosed with ADHD. I'm going to prioritize everybody. And so any black boy, I don't care if the mother is a doctor and the father is a millionaire, he needs FDMG just as much as a young brother in the ghetto. Why? Because his family is living a upper middle class life. And if we don't get to that young brother, sooner rather than later, he will be gobbled up by the black bourgeoisie in the white power structure. And he'll end up being a Barack Obama. He'll end up being a Judge Clarence Thomas. He'll end up being a rest in peace, Colin Powell. So all black boys need the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy. So there are no specific criteria beyond being grade appropriate for the levels that we're gonna offer. With regard to the curriculum, in addition to math, science, language, and social studies, we will have dietary and nutritional science, mm -hmm. agricultural and agronomical science, political and military science, financial and economic science, African spiritual and cosmological science, and science of the black man, woman, child, and community. Those are the six core, core curricula of the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy. He was talking about, the, he was trying to get the infrastructure done. And he was trying to keep everything in-house as far as, you know, hiring uh, black folks to do the work. You know, yes, and uh, you, it seems that uh, there was a lot of delay on getting the work done, right? So you couldn't yes, get sir. it done uh, with with dealing with dealing with the people trying to keep it in house, and so you had to go out house just to get it done. You had to outsource the work, and when you outsource the work with other people, it actually got done. It actually got done. Uh, we basically we basically struggled and sacrificed yes, get it done to try to keep the donation money within the black community by depending on black contractors. And all they did was scam us, scheme us, rob us, sabotage us, and undermine us. Uh, that's what we did for, for about, we got to school in February of 2019. Uh, so next month will be four years. February the 7th will be four years. And from February of 2019 until September of 2022, so that gives you 20 to 21, 19 to 20, 20. That gives you about three and a half years. We waited for black contractors. I decided to just go ahead and contract with white contractors. And when I decided to go with the white contractors, they got the school done 
in three in three three months. Compare three and a half years to three and a half months. Three and a half years for the blacks, never finished. Three and a half months for the whites, and we're almost done. Now, how disappointed was that, man? Speak about the disappointment that you had in trying to keep the money in the family, trying to feed black families, trying to, you know, do what everybody says, do support black business, bring black people in on certain things as far as projects, infrastructures, building, things like that. Don't hire outside of your race, whatever the case may be, but do business with black people first and make sure that you're feeding your own, keeping the money within your own community. Now, how disappointed was that when you did that and then it turned around, the services were null and void or you know well it was disappointing but at the same time it was very confirming and what i mean by that is that treatment that we received at the hands of black contractors only confirmed the critical necessity of why we need the frederick Douglass and marcus garvey academy in the first place mm -hmm. so those contractors reinforced my desire to get this school done because what they taught me was we will not be able to rebuild black america with the quality of black people that we have right now and mind you these are the builders so if we're talking about building black wall street if we're talking about building black infrastructure if we're talking about building black institutions mm -hmm. if we're talking about building black systems we need our carpenters we need our roofers our mm -hmm. welders our plumbers our electricians we need them. And so if they can't even do the job and do it right, even when they're being paid the rate they are asking, there were no discounts. This was what they were asking. They were being paid market wage and still couldn't do the work. You know, so again, it was just a re it was just a reinforcement and of so something they, I already knew, and that is we have to rebuild black consciousness one child at a time. It's too late for some grown folks because, and I'm coming at you from a psychological perspective, my background mm -hmm. is cognitive and that is behavioral therapy. My, my doctorate is in clinical psychology. And so when we are trained as therapists, we are taught to study our clients to see if they are ready for change. Readiness for change is a major psychological construct. Is your client ready to change? Are they ready to move on from their depression? Are they ready to move on from their low self-esteem? Are they ready to move on from their eating disorders? Are they ready to move on from their anxiety disorders? And we are taught that if they are not ready, if they are not ready to move on, to change their lives, you should leave them where they are. Most people who go to therapy will not get better. Let me say this again. This is a statistical fact. Most people who go to psychotherapy will not get better. You know why? They are not ready to change. They think that the therapist's job is to fix them. The therapist's job is not to fix you. The therapist's job is to coach you and guide you into how to fix yourself. And before there can be any treatment, before there can be any therapy, the client has to admit that they have a problem. That's the issue with Black America. We will not admit we hate self. We will not admit we operate off of internalized racism. We will not admit that America doesn't want us. We will not admit that we don't care about the black community. We are in eternal denial. Go to any black man with a snow bunny queen. Go to any black man with a snow bunny queen and ask him, why are you with this white woman? Not one of them will tell you self-hate. Not one of them will tell you <laughs> internalized racism. That's fact. Because yeah. they are in denial. <laughs> Go to any black woman. Yeah who has a white woman's hair color hmm. weaved into her head. Go to any black woman who has a white woman's hair color weaved into her head and ask her, why are you wearing fake blonde hair? I promise you, she will not tell you 
that it's because African hair is ugly and European mm -hmm. hair color and European hair texture is much more attractive than my own. I promise you, she will not tell you that because she is in denial. We are a race in denial and a people who will not admit that they have a problem cannot have that problem solved. Uh, so if you listen to some of the women when they talk about why they do their hair in such a way, why they wear the weaves, why they wear the, you know, the, the, the lace fronts and all of these things like that, why they get so is they're saying that it's easy to manage. They're saying they love the beautiful black hair, but the beautiful black hair is just a little too kinky for them and it's hard to maintain, hard for them to keep up with. So they just wrap the one wig on and go on ahead about their business. Is that a legitimate excuse to be walking around here looking uh, the way you're looking, looking uh, Negro European? Well, is that any better than the alcoholic who tells you, I might have had 20 beers today, but I'm doing better. Or I had 20 beers today because I had a bad day, but I normally don't drink that many. Or tell you that, that the reason I had to drink 20 beers is because that's how many I have to consume before I can get any response from the alcohol. What we're dealing with is a rationalization a rationalization for mental illness. Denial is the heart and soul of mental illness. Mm. Most people with problems don't like to admit that they have those problems, especially Black people when internal, with internalized racism issues. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you this. Is it a matter of peer pressure that women decide to not wear their hair in their natural state? Because the majority of the people in the society, as far as America is concerned, especially when you're dealing with African-American women, you're going to find streaky hair. It's not their hair. Maybe it is. They probably got a blowout or something like that. But for the most part, it's not going to be their hair. They're going to go pay $500, $1,000 to get that wig put in. They're going to get the perm, the whole nine yards. Now, do you feel that there's a lot of people out there, women out there, who really want to do that, but the peer pressure, the pressures of society to look away makes them not go, to, makes them not go down that road? Well, remember, groups can suffer from mental illnesses collectively. Let's take Gulf War Syndrome, right? A lot of soldiers who fought over in the middle, so-called Middle East, they came back with Gulf War Syndrome. Yes. The entire populations of soldiers were all struggling collectively with post-traumatic stress disorder. So yes, it's possible that that Black woman belongs to a Black community that is mentally ill itself. And so the peer pressure of mentally ill people is influencing another mentally ill person to walk around looking like a white girl. Mm. So let's, let's, let's go on the other side of it. How do you feel about uh, black men who like to date outside of their race? Do they have the same mental disorder that you're talking about right now? Of course they do. Of course they do. Mm. The Loving versus Virginia Supreme Court decision was rendered on June 13th, 1967, I believe. June 13th, 1967. So that's 77, 87, 97, 07, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. Mm -hmm. 56 years that the snow bunny crisis has been completely legal in this country. <laughs> 56 years since the snow bunny crisis has been completely legal in this country mm -hmm. and black men in half of a century as a numerical minority in this country mm -hmm. black men in half of a century have managed as a percentage of the overall population to marry out of their race more than the men of every other race put together mm -hmm. do you believe that is a coincidence of course it's not it's internalized racism Hmm. So it it's, it can't be just plain old, good old fashioned. I met someone. I like her. She like not, me. But no, mm -hmm. my brother, because you're not dealing with an individual crisis. Mm -hmm. You're dealing with a systemic problem. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you had one black man over here, one black man over here, one black man over here, that's an individual issue. Mm -hmm. You're talking about an entire system of black men who date out the race. Mm -hmm. Someone sent me a photo of the New York Knicks Christmas party. And every Negro <laughs> at the Christmas party had a snow bunny 
and the only black woman at the Christmas party had a snow puppy. That's not an individual issue, my brothers. That's a systemic problem. Uh, middle class black men, rich black men, overwhelmingly marry and date outside of the race. The Charles Barkleys of the world, the Jalen Roses of the world, the Michael Jordans of the world. I mean, look at your athletes and your entertainers. It's not one out of a bunch of them. They are overwhelmingly dating and marrying outside of the race. That is an epidemic, my brother. That is not an individual issue. Now, I, I've known men, black men, to say that they only date uh, white women, right? Or women outside of uh, the race, right? I've known guys like that. I've been and worked out with guys like that in gyms, things like that. And their main excuse as to why they do it, their main excuse as to why they do it is that the black woman is too rough. She's too attitudinal. She can't be put. She can't be put in a place. She's not submissive. She's not obedient. She's not the kind of woman that you would want to be around because she just wants to match your energy as a man. She's got too much masculine energy. That's the excuse that I hear. How, what do you say to that? I say that that might be true for a lot of black women, but it's not true for all black women. Mm -hmm. And even for the sisters for whom that does hold true, we have to ask ourselves, how did she get that way? Mm -hmm. The reason the black woman has had to adopt a masculine position is because she has been forced to uphold the masculine responsibilities within the household vis-a-vis -vis the black man as a result of the oppression of the black man and also as the result of the uh the, the the tendency of some black men to abandon their responsibilities to the black community and their responsibility to the black woman so how do you fault a black woman for being masculine when she was forced into that role of masculinity as a result of our absence and whether that absence came as a result of oppression by the white power structure whether that absence came as a result of black on black crime, whether that absence came as a result of chemical addiction, mm -hmm. gang banging, mm -hmm. mental illness, whatever the reason, the black woman was forced to assume the masculine responsibilities of the home and the community. How then we how can you fault a woman mm -hmm. for being masculine in order to take care of your responsibility because you were not there? How can that be her fault? Facts. I agree with that right there because somebody got to take care of the babies, right? Somebody got to step up if the man's not there, but that's the excuse that a lot of people give. So you're not buying it. You're, I, I can appreciate the fact that you also put a, put some of the blame on black women as well, but you're saying, hey, they're in this position, so you're going to be mentally conditioned to be that way, and it's hard to break that cycle of, of conditioning when you've been taking care of your own business for so long that you meet somebody, they're telling you to give it all to them. They're not willing to do that so uh, willingly, right? Well, and they shouldn't. Yeah. And they shouldn't. The black man has to prove himself to the black woman. Mm. He has to prove we have not been there. 70% of our children are being raised by their mothers alone. Mm. Now, don't get me wrong. Some of those women have forced the men out of their children's lives. I know this to be true. Some of the women have forced the, children, forced the men out of their children's lives. Most of the women did not force the men out of the children's lives. The men are simply not there because of reasons due to the white power structure or reasons due to their own personal issues with responsibility and accountability. Yeah. So black women are, are have been holding down the black community. She yeah. had to become masculine in order to do that, to fault her for becoming a certain way due to our absence. Is absolutely ridiculous. Mm. That's absolutely ridiculous. She's that way because we were not there. And you're going to have to go through a process of proving to the black woman that you are the man you claim to be so she can get comfortable enough to relinquish that role back to you. You don't just walk up and say, give me back that authority mm. after the black woman added intergenerationally for at least 50 or 60 years. Uh-uh. The black man has to prove himself. And if most of our men want to be nothing but rappers and basketball players, mm. then I don't expect black women to take us seriously anytime soon. Hey, you're preaching right now, man. I, I, I can understand that. And I think that's the position that a lot of people take. Because I hear women talk about this all the time when they're talking about relationships and they're saying, you know, they can't really just trust anybody and give themselves to anybody because they got a lot to lose. 
So if they put their life in your hands, if they, you know, quit their job, whatever, become a homemaker, and then you turn out to be no good, whatever the case may be, you got a gambling problem, whatever the case may be, and now she's stuck, you know, in a rut with you when she was already floating on her own just fine before you even came along. And she I'll had, give you an analogy. Yeah. I'll give you an analogy. You are in the process of moving bricks by yourself. You got about 50,000 bricks that have to be moved from one side of the street to the other side of the street. You ain't got nobody helping you. You're doing this all by yourself, my brother. It's you. Mm -hmm. And I show up. Dr. Umar shows up. And I say, yo, bro, you've been working all day, man. Why don't you take a break? Take a break for two hours. Go take a nap. Go get something to eat. Come back. When you come back, I would have moved all the bricks that you would have moved in those two hours. You feel me? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to do two hours worth of your work for you in the same amount of bricks you would have moved. I will have moved when you come back from the two hour break. Right. You come back from the two hour break. And I didn't move none of those bricks. Instead, I had an excuse for why I couldn't get it done. Did I or did I not just set you back? Mm -hmm. You were in a groove. You was in a flow. You had a routine. If I never came and interrupted what you was doing, you would have got that whole job done by the end of the day. But I came and I did what? I manipulated your trust. Mm. I manipulated you into trusting me. And in trusting me, I sabotaged your responsibilities and your operations. That's what the black woman is up against. When a black man shows up to a black woman, we manipulate her trust. Some of us do it honestly. She gives right. us a chance, she trusts us, and we prove good on the promise. But a lot of us do not prove good on the promise. And a lot of black men are so ready and willing to blame a black woman's attitude for why he abandoned her. And in that mm -hmm. type of a situation, I can totally understand why a lot of black women don't feel comfortable giving a black man a chance to handle the responsibility because a lot of us are not strong enough to do it. We have to be honest. Black men have gotten so comfortable with black women taking the lead. Mm. So many black men have gotten so comfortable with black women taking the lead that we don't even want to lead back. We're comfortable with her paying the bills. We're comfortable with her taking care of the business. I work in the school system, my brother. Mm -hmm. When they're trying to put our sons in special ed, mm -hmm. the father ain't in those meetings. When they're trying to put our sons on Ritalin and Adderall and Concerta and Cycler, the father's not there. 99% mm -hmm. of the time, I've been doing this for 25 years. That's a quarter of a century. 99% right. of the time, when somebody is in there fighting for our black boys, it's not the black father, it's the black mother. I live it and I see it. Why don't the fathers come and fight for their sons? Why are they so comfortable letting the mother go in there and fight a whole gang of white folks to keep your son, who you claim you love so much, out of special ed? We have to stop being a walking contradiction. Yes, there's blame on both sides. There's responsibility on both sides. There's accountability on both sides. But I'm going to tell you this right now. There is nothing less attractive to a woman. Mm -hmm. There is nothing less attractive to a woman. Or should I say, there's nothing more unattractive to a woman than a black man full of excuses. Mm, all right, man. Hey, I've seen that myself, man. As a man who raised my children, I had custody of mine, and I've been to the schools, and I was the only man there <laughs> in a lot of cases. You know, so, hey, we got a question in the chat, man. Salute to Crook from the Brook. Thank you for the $20 super chat. He says, would you speak more in depth on the black self-hate concept and its origins? Thank you. Well, I think we covered it enough. I don't think we have to intellectually masturbate it too much. We was conditioned by the white power structure during slavery to hate ourselves. We basically took the white man's mentality and we psychosurgically implanted it in our own consciousness. We are internally white people. Psychologically, most American Africans are Europeans, which is why I use the term Negro being. You look like an African, but you think and act like a European. That is most of us. Not only do we get that conditioning from slavery, we get that conditioning from our parents. We get that conditioning from black church. We get that conditioning from media. We get that conditioning from public school. We get that conditioning from college. 
What did Dr. Carter G. Woodson say? Miseducation of the Negro. If you haven't read the book, go read the book. He said the college educated Negro is seldom of any use to his race because the education he received is an education that educates him away from his people. So by the time he gets out of the college university, W.E.B. Du Bois, he's so far removed from his people's everyday struggle that he is almost of no use to his people. Mm. So we were not only traumatized to be Europeanized, that Europeanization of the African psyche is reinforced by every institution that we go to, which is why I always say, I always say, you cannot send black children to white public schools and expect them to be loyal Africans. Mm. Okay, so are you saying that schools, as far as the public schools right here in America, indoctrinate black children to not be have any loyalty to their own people or race or anything like that? Or just, is that what yeah, you're yeah, saying? I, I repeat that. Are you saying that a black child attending a school, and as far as the infrastructure in America is concerned, the American school system, a black child attends their school, they're going to be indoctrinated to not have any loyalties to their race? Of course, they're going to be indoctrinated to love white people, to depend on white people, and to defend white people. Absolutely. It's not a crime of commission. It's a crime of omission. They don't have to tell the black child to hate themselves. They will automatically conclude that they are not worth loving because they don't see themselves reflected at all in any of the successes or accomplishments that are presented to them during the course of their education in the public school system. So it's not commission. They don't have to tell you to hate yourself. You learn to hate yourself by default as a result of not being included in the curriculum that you're digesting. Mm. So that so you're saying the curriculum should include more black history or more no, talk about no, no, just no. White people teaching black children who they are is not a solution. Let me mm. say that again. And this is where I disagree with people like Dr. Malefi Asante, mm -hmm. you know, the um, father father of modern Afrocentricity who helped create the first Ph.D. program in Africana studies here in North Philadelphia at Temple right. University. I disagree with him. I disagree with some of our late elders as well who thought that it was a good thing to get white people to teach black kids who they are. I do not support that. I did not support that. White people have no business teaching black children their history. That is ridiculous. That is a total contradiction. Why? If we love ourselves so much, mm -hmm. if we respect ourselves so much, if we value our history and culture so much, why are you going to your oppressor and asking his women to teach your children, not his children? You're going to your oppressor and asking his women to teach your children who they are. That is insane. Nobody should be teaching your children who they are except you. But we are so damn lazy, so ship so shiftless, so disinterested in our predicament as a people that we think getting white people to teach black girls about Ida B. Wells and teach black girls about Fannie Lou Hamer and teach black girls about Queen Mother Harriet Tubman. We think it's okay to get white men to teach the Honorable Marcus Garvey, get white men to teach El Hajj Malik El Shabazz Malcolm X, get white men to teach our children about Nat Turner and Gabriel Prosser. What in the hell do I want my enemy doing teaching my child who they are? Black history must be taught by black people. That's why it's called black in the first place. Facts. I, I mean, I agree with that. You know, and who who's going to teach you about your people that's going to really empower you in such a way, right? Because learning about Nat Turner, learning about Malcolm X, learning about Marcus Garvey, that's going to empower you in a way. So I remember being in school as a kid. You know, I learned about George Washington. I learned about Abraham Lincoln. I learned about, you understand what I'm saying? I, you know, we didn't really get any education about our people as far as where I'm from, except for the Dr. Martin Luther King. That was it, right? But that's said, not their job. Yeah. I you get understand? It. Yeah. I'm not even blaming the white man mm. for not teaching you who you are. That's not his job. That is your job. We have black churches on every other corner. If you have a black church on every other corner and teachers are overwhelmingly Christian, 
why don't we have a black history class in every church? Why are none of these PhDs in African studies, why aren't they giving out free black history lessons in the community on the weekend? You know why? Because they are black capitalists. That's why. They care about money. They don't care about freedom. They care about money. It's the same thing with the 1619 Project. The, the, it, it's the same issue with, uh, with uh, what do they call it? Uh, uh, what's, what's the name of the uh, academic approach to racism? Critical race theory. Same thing. Yeah, Why aren't the critical race theorists teaching critical race theory in the black community? Because they want money. All this is about money. Most black people are hustlers. They're not givers. They're takers. Mm. Our PhDs in black studies, they are takers. They're not givers. Most of us are trying to turn a dollar over with another ne the next African. We're not trying to liberate ourselves. We are more capitalists than the Caucasian. But we are more but, capitalists. But than the aren't we in a capitalistic society? So what? That don't mean you have to practice capitalism mm. because you are in a capitalistic society. Capitalism is not synonymous with economic exchange. You understand me? Mm. So if I'm selling you something right on and that. you buy it, okay. if I'm selling something and mm. you buy it, that's not capitalism. Okay. That's just business. Mm. That predates capitalism. We conducted business in Africa before the white man brought us capitalism. Capitalism is the monopolization of business by the few to the exploitation and detriment of the many. Capitalism doesn't say I just want enough to be comfortable. Capitalism says I want to have so much that you have to come and beg me for a piece in order to survive. Capitalism is the domination of resources needed by the many, but it's in the hands of the few. That's a great explanation of capitalism because anybody would say capitalism is the buying and selling of goods. You're saying that's not capitalism. No, the buying that's just and selling of goods is commerce. Mm. That's not capitalism. That's commerce. Okay. Capitalism is the monopolization of the resources necessary in order to enter business in the first place. Mm. I respect that. I like I like that uh, that concept. And yeah. capitalism is synonymous with white supremacy because capitalism is white supremacy's economic system. Capitalism was handmade for the European. Think about this. Why would a minority need to dominate the majority of the resources? Mm -hmm. Black people have never needed to dominate the majority of the resources. Mm -hmm. The only people who need to do that are a people who are already in a minority to begin with, and that's the Caucasian. That's the Caucasian. That's why he's the father of capitalism, because he is a numerical minority who wants to control everything, i.e. capitalism. But is, is it that way mentally, though? What do you mean? Are they a minority mentally as well as as, as far as numbers are concerned? Because you got like you just said, you got people in our race, black people who are Negro -pian. Right. So mentally, they may have they may have the numbers there because there's a lot of people who will acquiesce into white well, society, white culture, I things think, like that. I think I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Numerically, they are a minority. OK, there's no getting around that. Mm -hmm. But what you are speaking of is do they have enough surrogate Neanderthals? Mm -hmm. Do they have enough Negro peons mm -hmm. and Asian peons and Latino peons? And Arabians who are willing to serve as substitute Caucasians in order to enrich and empower the global white power structure. Absolutely, yes. Okay. Absolutely, yes. Which is why mm -hmm. I did not celebrate the report that said by the year 2050, Caucasians would only be 7% of the world's population. <laughs> A lot of black people. Yeah. Yeah. By 2050, according to the United Nations, mm -hmm. by 2050, Caucasians will be 7% of the planet. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're already only about, they're only about 10 now. They're mm -hmm. going to shrink even lower. Mm -hmm. I didn't celebrate that. Why? Because he's always been a global minority. And mm -hmm. he has been able to manipulate members of other races 
into identifying and aligning themselves with him. So he's a master of getting other people to join in with his wickedness. So I don't celebrate him becoming an numerical minority because all that means is he's going to become more diabolical, more, no, more Machiavellian, and more manipulative in his need to bring other people into his fold. Now speak to this. There's there's a there's a sentiment, right? That not just even when it comes to you, when it comes to uh, black people that are purporting to do anything, period. Say, I'm, I want to do this. I want to do this. I want to do that. I got goals. I got dreams. I got things I'm trying to do. What is it with us when we look at us, when we say we got aspirations, dreams and desires? What is it with this thing where everybody says, well, what the hell is taking you so long? Why don't why we why don't we get the respect of process? Because black people have very little faith in other black people. And I would even argue that that little faith, to some extent, is well earned. Because most of us have been scammed by black people. We have been robbed by black people. We have been done wrong by other black people. But mm -hmm. for people like me, who believe in the potential for black redemption, mm -hmm. I believe unapologetically yeah. in the potential for African racial reconstruction and emancipation. And so because of that, it doesn't matter how many times you've done me wrong. I'm still going to go back to my people because we are all we got. Take the contractors who did us wrong. Mm -hmm. That wasn't every black contractor in the country. Yeah. And I know there's some good black contractors out there. And guess what? I'm going to keep on looking until I find the right ones because we still have to renovate the Honorable Frederick Douglass High School across the street, which is three times as big as the Honorable Marcus Garvey Elementary School. So I'm not giving up on black contractors. I know there's good ones. I just haven't found them. You cannot abandon your race and consider yourself to be loyal to it. You understand? I'm going down with the ship or I'm going up with the ship. That's it. But I will not abandon the ship. Okay. I respect that, man. Now, uh, the reason I say that, man, is because people got this thing where they just expect for something to happen just like that. And they don't well, have the same energy. With my situation. Yeah, but no, that's what I'm speaking Academy. I'm speaking on that inadvertently, but, uh, you, you know, but uh, uh, not inadvertently, but in a roundabout way, um, everybody else gets the respect of process. Everybody else gets the respect because of process. Because we don't have any faith and trust. Yes. We don't have any faith and trust. Mm -hmm. But when we look at the FDMG process, uh, we did not take a long time when you understand anything about planning schools. Mm -hmm. See, the issue with social media mm -hmm. is it makes complete nobodies experts in areas they have no experience in. You understand? Mm -hmm. So everybody considers themselves an expert yeah. in an area they have no experience in. Yeah. Why is it taking him so long to do the school? Yeah. So long according to what standard? Mm -hmm. And how would you know since you never built a school yourself? You see that? So you get conjecture disguised as expertise. I'll give you an example. Yeah. I heard one coon say he's lying about the HVAC. I talked to my cousin and he said you can get an HVAC for five thousand dollars. This is what not for a school. <laughs> hey, thank you, thank you. Well, that's the point I was coming to. Show me a school anywhere on the planet Earth with a five thousand dollar yeah. HVAC system running it. I want to see that. But this is the conjecture and the nonsense that often gets passed off as expertise. Mm. I am the only person in the history of this country building the school that I'm building. So nobody can have an opinion on it because nobody has ever done it. Never before has there been an independent black school built exclusively with contributions from all over the black African world. This is the first school in this country. So nobody can have an opinion on it because nobody ever did it before. I'm the first. Yeah. And, and we always say this quote, right? You know, Rome wasn't built in a day, but, you know, it, it's, it's you, people are selective when they apply that to certain people. You understand what I'm saying? So we gotta mm -hmm. we gotta learn to be patient with one another and we gotta learn well, to respect we also the process. Can't have thin skin either. We also can't have thin skin. Yeah, and what yeah. I mean by that is, yeah. you know, people ask me all the time, one of the most uh 
frequently asked questions I get in the airport, the restaurant, at the lecture. People always ask me, Dr. Umar, how do you keep on going with the type of criticism that you get? And the answer is real simple. I don't pay attention to it. I'm the expert, not them. I'm the one building the school, not them. I'm the one saving black children every day, not them. What do I care what they have to say about it? You understand? I focus on the people who support me. I focus on the people who love me. I focus on the people who've been donating to this cause for the past nine years. That's what I'm focusing on. I could care less what a detractor has to say about it. I get people all the day. I want to have a conversation with you about your school. And how much did you donate to this project? Well, I haven't donated anything yet. Mm -hmm. Click. This conversation over, bro. Right. We've been at this for nine years. You ain't gave a penny, but you expect them to take time out of my day. I'm supposed to waste time out of my day to talk to somebody who finances white folks every day, finances Chinese every day, finances Mexicans and Arabs, but you ain't give a dollar for a school for black boys when you see the type of outcomes that black boys are having in the American public school system, and you won't even give a dollar to it because you have no faith in your own people, but you freely and regularly finance other groups on a daily basis, and you think I'm going to waste some of my time having a conversation with you? There's nothing I find more interesting over these past nine years than the number of Negroes who think I'm supposed to have a conversation with them when they haven't sacrificed a single penny for FDMG. No conversation over here. Keep it pushing. Hey, I, I feel you on that, man. But look, so there's always going to be some type of controversy around this subject, but I would just urge people, man, to just respect the process. You understand what I'm saying? Like, I, I, this is the this is. I wouldn't even say urge you. Let them do what they're gonna do. This, but this is a this is a a valiant effort. I feel that you're putting up. So, and the to me, I'm not tripping on it because if I had children of school age, when you open the school, I'll send my kids to your school, bro. Because I hear the rhetoric that you talk, and I'm like, yo, kids gonna come out there fly as hell. In absolutely, my opinion. but even for the people who don't want to send their kids there, I'm okay with that too. See, the issue. I need people to understand I'm not in a popularity contest. Yeah. That's the one thing people don't get. I am the most influential black scholar in the world. I've never been on Oprah. I'm the most requested scholar in the world. My Breakfast Club interviews get more views than your favorite rapper. They do. You understand? Okay. Yeah. So I'm not in I'm not, I'm not I'm, I've already run the popularity contest, bro. I didn't I didn't laugh that 50 times over. So for me, I don't care what they want to do. If you don't want to send your kids to the school, I'm fine with that. If you hate the school, I'm fine with that. If you have no faith in the school, and I'm not speaking about you particularly, my yeah, brother. Yeah, I get it. I'm get speaking it. in generally. It don't matter. Let niggas do what niggas do and let those of us who believe in building, let's build. That's it. Mm -hmm. Facts. Hey, so look, let's pivot a little bit. Now, I, I I know that you've had your criticisms of the brother Shannon Sharp, right? Now, mm -hmm. how do you feel? Now, this, this I'm like, it's a two part question. How do you feel about um, Skip Bayless insensitive tweet about the young brother that damn near lost his life on the field playing football and he's recovering? Um, prayers up to him. And also on the yeah. other side of that, how do you feel about Shannon Sharp seemingly be tired of Skip Bayless's? nonsense even live on the air if a black man made the comments that skip bayless made mm -hmm. he probably would have lost his job absolutely <laughs> if no, that would have been he took it down. Brady, if that would have been tom brady mm -hmm. and shannon sharp would have said that shannon would have lost his job yeah but it didn't happen because the blacks in sports media, the Stephen A's, the Jalen Roses, the Richard Jeffersons, they're too cowardly to stand up and demand respect. They're cowards. Okay. Mm -hmm. Most black athletes and entertainers are cowards. And we know why. They make their money through the white economic power structure. And because they make their money that way, and since black people love money more than respect, let me say that one more time. Black people love money more than respect. Most of them would never risk their income 
for self-respect and honor for their people. So we're never going to get anywhere waiting on athletes and entertainers to fight for us. Nor should we, because it's not the job of the athlete and entertainer to fight. They're there to entertain. Their only purpose is to give your child a little bit of self-esteem by seeing them dunk a ball or, or run around the track or catch a football. That's all they're there for, to make sure black kids can see themselves on television. Outside of that, they're useless to the power struggle, which is why they don't do anything for the black community. OK, you see, every time I go to the breakfast club, they keep talking about LeBron James school. LeBron James don't even have a damn school. You understand? But they keep bringing it up what like you it mean? exists. Say that again. What do you mean? What I said. <laughs> LeBron James doesn't have a school. There's a public school with LeBron okay. James's name on it. OK. You understand? That's not his school. No black entertainer has built an independent school that I'm aware of. If you know of one, please let me know. Mm. So, uh, how, so how do you feel about LeBron? James? A lot of people say LeBron James is one of the athletes that's at the top of the food chain, right? He's at the top of the food chain, probably a billionaire I right now. LeBron. He's a good example of a responsible black man. Okay, he is a poor. No controversy, example. no controversy around his name, no drama, no nonsense. But a lot of people say he will sp speak up and say some real things. He he criticized uh, uh old boy. What's what's his name? Uh, Jerry Jones. He said that, you know, everybody ain't got nothing to say about Jerry Jones because Jerry Jones got caught in that photo back in the 60s or the 50s, whenever the hell that was, as a, as a young man, 14-year-old kid, um, in a controversial moment that black people went through back then when they was busting in black kids in school. Um, LeBron James uh, pretty much said, uh, why, why is anybody, anybody criticizing him? But you worried about, I guess, Kyrie. No, that was Kanye. a great. Great monologue by LeBron James, and I gave him a shout out for that on my like during my last Breakfast Club conversation. LeBron James is a great example of a responsible black man, as I started to say a minute ago. He's a great example of a responsible black man. He is a poor example of a black activist or a black sports activist. LeBron James hasn't done anything at all to fight against any of the major problems that black people have, not at all. You understand me? Responsible black man, absolutely. Black wife, black children, good example of a responsible law abiding black man. Black activist, absolutely not. He's done nothing of substance. Okay, uh, even with the school? Billionaires don't get away with words in my book, right? So when I was having that conversation with the good brother Charlemagne, he kept talking about how LeBron James speaks out. You are a billionaire. OK. Brothers and sisters in the grassroots, they can speak out. Mm. If you want to speak out as a billionaire, speak out. But you're not getting away just because you offered your opinion on a social issue when you're worth billions of dollars. You should be building institutions. You should be solving problems. So nobody's going to come to me and talk about a billionaire has been speaking out. Tyler Perry spoke out. Oprah Winfrey spoke out. Puffy Combs spoke out. Kanye has spoke out more than all of them put together. Yeah. But Kanye has yet to build a black institution. I don't want to hear about words from billionaires. I want to see deeds. So you think that none of these uh, athlete superstars have any deeds that you would properly respect? As far as no, no, no. Let me be more specific because I don't want to. I don't want you to use the word think because I'm not thinking. I'm okay. speaking facts here, so we're not going to say think because think suggests that it's just my opinion. It's not a fact. Okay. I'm going to ask you again, according to Let's my to thing, it. and I tend to have a higher standard than most people. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Major institutions: mm -hmm. school, bank, hospital, supermarket, manufacturing, and distribution. Those are the five critical institutions. Now let's look at the five critical problems. Miseducation, mass incarceration, gentrification, police genocide, access to wealth. I just gave you the five major institutions and the five major problems. Mm -hmm. Give me the athlete or the entertainer that is either building one of those five institutions or tackling one of those five problems. I'll wait for your answer. 
I mean, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Because <laughs> there are none. There are none. There's probably aren't there any. Are <laughs> and see, what we but like why, to do but, is but we like to make thing, but why? for celebrities because we're just as lazy and disinterested as they are. You understand me? Mm-hmm. See, when Deion Sanders left Jackson State, mm-hmm. all the black men decided you about that. with Deion, sided with Deion because they would do the same thing. If a white school offers me five million dollars a year, you damn right I'm gonna turn my back on the black college because that's who we are. We have not been authentically black since Dr. King. Ever since desegregation, every black person has decided to blaze a trail to fulfill their own agenda. There hasn't been a black community in 50 years. Nobody cares about the group. Everybody is about themselves. The only time we start talking about the group is when white supremacy steps on our toes. And then all of a sudden, we want all black people to come to our beck and call. Other than that, all we care about is our damn selves. I can agree with that. But but the, the question is, right, for me, like, why? Like like why, why like, 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 like like where does anybody in their in their mind get generate all of this money to these athletes, stars, movie stars, whatever they generate and not think to say, Let me take a bit of this, let's all congregate together, throw this money in a pile, and let's build at least one institution for us in this country. At least one parallel industry for us in this country, in the world. We don't we don't have any parallel industries. We don't have a black NFL, black NBA, black Hollywood. You know, I guess Tyler Perry, can, like people would say he's close to well, that. They, they don't want a black NBA. They want to be validated by white people. That's, That's why black people will, black entertainers will routinely skip the BET Awards or skip the Soul Train Awards. But they almost never skip the you know Grammys what? You or know the what? American Umar. You know what? Umar. Music Association. Works. I noticed that years ago. I always wondered why the fuck is Jay Z fifty and I, I ain't at the BT Award, but they always at the Grammy. They always at the MTV Award. Because we value white approval, my brother. <laughs> Let me say this to you, and I want to be very, very clear, because it is part of the central nexus of our problem. Black people have not achieved psychological freedom yet. I want to say this again. 157 years ago, on December the 7th of 1865, the states ratified the 13th Amendment. Two-thirds of the states ratified the 13th Amendment, which gave us physical emancipation. We have not yet achieved psychological emancipation. That's why we'd rather be at the Grammys than the BET Award. That's why we will send our kids to a white public school where we know they're being miseducated instead of building a black one. This is why black women have no problem spending $30 billion a year to look like a white girl when they can use that money to build a black school for every black girl in the country. This is why the black man can walk around an army of black women with a white woman and not even speak to the black woman around because we are still psychologically enslaved. And until you are psychologically emancipated, you will never be able to do anything else. That's why the Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey Academy is such a priority for me. Frederick Douglass said it best when he said, it's better to raise strong men, excuse me, it's better to raise strong children than to repair broken men. That's a deep line. You said earlier, you said earlier, Mm -hmm. do we have to throw the adults away? Not all of them, Mm -hmm. but most of them. If you were to ask me right now, of the 50 million Africans in America, how many of them do you think are really, really ready, really, really ready for a true social, intellectual, 
cultural, economic, political revolution in black America. Not war, not war, yeah. just a revolution within the community itself. Who's willing to sacrifice their time, their money, their resources? Of the 50 million of us, my brother, I would say five. Five million yeah. out of 50. That's it. 10% are ready to sacrifice. The rest couldn't care less. Now, that was some pivotal moments where that could have happened. I remember uh, the Donald Sterling situation. That was a thing out there where people were saying they shouldn't play, right? But remember, yes. I want you to say this. I want you to speak on this. It was it was a Lakers game against somebody else, and LeBron James said he spoke to because everybody was looking for LeBron. Like, what LeBron gonna do, right? LeBron and, spoke, and, and and LeBron said he spoke to Barack Obama. He said Barack told him to play. He said that's why they yeah, went out there and played. That wasn't the uh, Sterling situation. That was the uh, NBA bubble playoffs. When well, the that Milwaukee was the, Bucks that was, the was ball, going my to, bad. You're right. Yeah, the Milwaukee right. Bucks was going to protest as a result of of the shooting of Jacob Blake in Kenosha, yes. Wisconsin. Yes, yes, yes. And LeBron said he spoke to Michael Jordan and Barack Obama, two of the biggest coons in American history, <laughs> and they told him to keep on playing basketball. He tried to put it on them. LeBron. The bottom line is LeBron saw an opportunity to get another ring, and he prioritized a fourth ring over the dignity, respect, and life of Black America. LeBron James is not an activist. I know y'all want to keep on making him one. He's a good example of a responsible Black man. Yeah. He ain't no damn activist. He does not go in the same category with Muhammad Ali. He does not go in the same category as Colin Kaepernick. Hell no, hell no. But the reason the NFL tries to paint LeBron as an activist is because they want to make it look like they are tolerant of black activism. So they paint LeBron as an activist because it makes the NBA look like they are liberal and accepting of black activism when they are not. Yeah, because uh, I think the, the situation I was speaking about, the Donald Sterling thing, because they was like, should they play? And I was like, if they wouldn't have played, same thing with Colin Kaepernick, if those guys would have stood in unison, that would have been a, a, a great change right there. That would have been monumental as far because, hey, they don't like us. They don't love us, but we drive the dollar, right? When it comes to the dollar, when it comes to the, the style, the culture, whatever the hell that we do, the athleticism that we got, you know, the, the music that we make, whatever the case may be, people are going to tune in to what black folks are doing. We have the flavor. We have the style. So, But we don't get the benefits and we don't reap the money that comes from the things that we produce, they do. So I, I I wonder why, as a collective, a lot of these athletes, stars, or whatever the case may be, have never realized that and just came to a realization that, you know what, let's just sit this one out for a little bit. And then maybe we can get some changes as far as people there taking no Black, Remember what I told you, black people love money more than respect. Yeah, and it kills me, man, that, that, you know, people have, you know, black clothing designs, clothing designers. They they struggling. They can't. You know, they got great designs. They got great no, products. We love white people. We want white people. They want the Gucci. They want the Prada. They want, the, they they, want white merchandise. Black yeah. merchandise ain't good. It ain't we good are enough. Negro peons. We have the exact same mind as white people do. And that's why you always hear me say, until we destroy. The cracker living inside of us, we will never overcome the cracker living outside of us. You have mm. to first win the war with the racist in you. You see that? Mm -hmm. When do we defeat the racist living inside of our head? Every black man got a little white boy inside of him, every black woman got a little white girl inside of her. When do you defeat them? Because if you don't win the war with the white person living inside of you, you'll never win the war with the white person living outside. Okay, now, with that said, let me ask you about this. How do you feel about the 
the war, the diaspora wars that's been going on as far as Twitter is concerned, as far as Facebook over the past year, or well, maybe less than a year, there's been this diaspora war, African against the African-American, African-American versus the Caribbean, the Caribbean versus African-Americans. We, If we come from America, everybody else looks down upon us. Africans look down upon us. They frown upon us. They say that we're this, this, that, and the third. How do you feel about it? I know you have got wind of this. The diaspora war, how do you feel about it? That's what Negro peons do. They fight amongst themselves. They never unify and fight against a common oppressor. That's what we do. We all came from the same place. Mm -hmm. But we are identifying with the slave master and where he enslaved us. He enslaved me in Jamaica. I'm a Jamaican. He enslaved me in America. I'm an American. He enslaved me in Brazil. I'm a South American. He enslaved me in Puerto Rico. I'm a Puerto Rican. Nobody's focusing on where you all came from. The same slave ships brought us over here. We came from the same countries. Back home, you might even be a cousin to the brother you fighting with today who speaks a different language, pledges a different flag, and lives on another land. I'm a Pan-Africanist. So I have no tolerance for Negro Pian behaviors. As far as I'm concerned, all Africans are but one family. That is the core, heart and soul of what we stand for as Pan-Africanists. So I will not tolerate that type of behavior, nor will it be accepted at the Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey Academy. That is a Pan-African institution. If you come to that campus disrespecting somebody because they come from a different branch of the African family because they speak a different language, because they have a different type of hair, a different skin tone. If you disrespect an African on my campus, you will be entered into the book of Negroes and you will never be allowed on that campus again. How do you feel about Africans that disrespect uh, African Americans? Are you looking at it as, are we all just Africans? Was you must not have heard what I just said. I already answered that, okay. my brother. There we go. We are all one people. Okay. So it don't matter if you're from Africa. It don't matter if you're from the Caribbean. It don't matter if you're from right here in the 50 states. It don't matter if you're visiting from Australia or England. If you disrespect another African, you are banned from the campus. Okay. I don't have different rules for different groups. I do not practice tribalism. I practice pan-Africanism. There you go. Okay, okay. Because that's tribalism. Thank you for answering that, man. That was... Uh... I, I was always wondering how you was going to answer that question, but that's that's deep what you said. We you look at everybody as one people. You don't you don't put people in a dip, dissect people in the different sections around the world. Tribalism, no sir. Tribalism. Um, the only tribe I belong to is the Pan African tribe. Black people who see us all as one family. So you don't go, you don't you don't subscribe to the notion that Jesse Jesse, Jesse Jackson put out there that the African American term. I don't have a problem with somebody calling themselves an American African. Okay. Just like you could be a Jamaican African, a Nigerian African, a British African, a Brazilian African. That's not the issue. The issue is do you identify with your kith and kin from around the world? That's the issue. We live in a global world. This is a global world that we live in. We don't have the benefit of tribalism. Tribalism is not a panacea. For white supremacy the white man is globally organized mm -hmm. the asian is globally organized the arab the east everybody is globally organized except us and that's why we on the bottom we would rather fight with each other mm. than fight to end racism mm. facts i agree with that now speak about one thing that we need to unite and combine to get done reparations right now Reparations is going to be a hot topic this coming election. Every election, everybody's talking about reparations. California just passed a reparations bill where some people supposed to get $200,000 plus a piece or whatever the case may be. What are your thoughts on that? And what's your perspective on reparations as a whole? Well, let me ask you first, what are your thoughts on it? What has any black person in California, what do you think they're going to do with the $233,000? They, they're going. 
I, I, some people are going to be responsible, but let's just be honest. Most of them are going to do what with that two hundred thirty? They, they're going to put it back into the economy, and, 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 not, and not and not and not, and not in assets. <laughs> and how does that solve any of our problems? It doesn't. And this may exactly. be a one-time fee. Am I correct? Of course, it's one time. One time, and of you're course. done. So then. However long it takes you to blow that money, you're right back in the uh -huh. same situation that you were before. Uh -huh. So that's technically that's not reparations. That's a stimulus package. A very large one, if you would say. And you're stimulating the European economy. You're not stimulating the black economy. Yeah. Now, yeah. yeah so and that's exactly why I am of the opinion that the current generation of African people in this country have no business have no right whatsoever to be trying to lay their hands on the restitution package for my ancestors. Hell no. The 21st century Negro has done nothing at all to justify him and her being the vanguard for the reparation struggle. What have we done these 23 years of the 21st century that gives us the audacity to think that we should be handling a restitution package for African people. Mm. What have we built? What have we changed? What have we fought? What have we done? We're the worst group of Africans to ever walk this country. Absolutely the worst. <laughs> Absolute uh, worst. No Negro got no business. No Negro in America today has any business talking about we want to talk about reparations and we want to receive reparations. You ain't got no pride. You ain't got no race loyalty. You ain't got no economy, no institutions, not a single black Wall Street, but you want my ancestors reparations. Uh-uh. No. Tailor it until a more responsible, more progressive, more revolutionary, more revolutionary and more conscious group of Africans come along. Let them take care of the reparations. We should not. I vote no, not this no. Hell, not these niggas. Not, no. not, so are you saying not this generation or not this no. lifetime? Those of us who are living now. So for example, if yeah. you take the babies, yeah. let's take the babies. Mm -hmm. When they get to be 30 years old, if we raise them the right way, I'll give you a better example. FDMG Academy will open its doors next summer, mm -hmm. 2024. Okay. Okay, when those young men are 30, yeah, they will have been educated, taught, and trained how to handle reparations, what to ask for. They will be in a position to handle reparations for their people, but we are not. Uh, I, I think that we may be a little too fragmented right here today to kind of deal with such a monumental feat, right? That like, like, all, like all you're saying the same thing I'm saying. Yeah. You're saying the exact yeah. same I, thing. I, I'm I, I agree with that right there because we do, you know, uh, a lot of us, we tend to kind of ignore the issues that, take, that go on in our community. We try to sweep it under the rug. We try to act like it's not there. You understand what I'm saying? So I do agree with that, but the issue is still going to come forth, right? Well, let the issue how, come forth. How, so how can we now well, today? Let me tell you what's going to happen. Yeah. You're going to get it, and it's not going to be much because you're too disorganized to demand much. Do you follow me, my brother? Mm -hmm. It's not going to be much because mm -hmm. you're too disorganized to demand much. Mm -hmm. And you're going to waste it. And it's going to be over. And the white man going to say, get out of my face. I already gave you Negroes some money. Mm -hmm. You got your cars, you got your clothes, you got your white girl, we're done. So let me ask you a question. Because all this, we're gonna this, do, because, because all this we're gonna, is, all, all do is take it, like you said, you said it yourself and you were correct. Yeah. We're just gonna put it right back in the white man's economy. We're yeah, not yeah. we're we're not if if, if we're not doing nothing with the two <laughs> trillion we already have, my brother. Naturally. We didn't use do the stimulus checks, yeah. we don't use tax returns, we don't use regular income. The PPP we don't fraud, use the they didn't even use that. Income. Exactly. <laughs> you're talking about 50 million Negroes who want to be white people, and you're going to give them reparations, and you think they're going to use it to benefit black people. You are, we are insane. Yeah. We are absolutely insane. So, 
I think the reparations issue is it's got to pivot into the voting issue right now. How do you feel? Because I I, you know, I don't know if I ever heard your perspective on this. I don't as believe far as voting got loyalty voting doesn't have to have anything to do with reparations. They do. They are not necessarily linked. You want to know why? You want to know why? I do. It's the same reason why getting out of slavery had nothing to do with the vote. It's the same reason why the civil rights bill didn't really have nothing to do with the vote. Because mm-hmm. when black people are organized, you can get anything you want from this government. I believe that. If you are organized, you can get any kind of reparations you wanted. But you're disorganized, mm-hmm. and that's why it has to be decided by a vote. That's why they show up tap dancing with hot sauce in the purse. You know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, exactly. Doing the dougie at the church. Because they know that that'll galvanize us. They know we're not as a collective, as far as the Democratic Party is concerned, I ain't no Democrat. I don't fuck with it. I, I'm just saying, if we haven't learned from history that the Democratic Party really don't give a damn, maybe the Republican too, but at least, but but black folks has been more loyal to the Democratic Party historically, right? Even though we started as as Republicans, if we haven't seen that by now, mm-hmm. then as far as politics is concerned. We may have to wait for the next generation or the next lifetime. You might be right about that because if we're still stuck, what there, have we done <laughs> functionally and progressively these twenty three years? Give me something. Give me. I don't care what it is. Give me one thing. You mean uh, celebrities, ind- independently? grassroots, middle class? Give me one thing. Black people have done functionally and progressively this uh, century, this millennium. As a the co- century in the millennium. millennium. <laughs> <laughs> because as a, as a we're in a new millennium. We're in a new century and we're in a new millennium. 2000. Y2K. Well, I, I, I think we had some great feats, but it it didn't like manif- what? It didn't manifest. What? Great feats it, like what? I mean, you are, you, you listen, you're well versed in this shit, but as far as our inventions, but it didn't, one it, great it didn't cross over. It, 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 didn't, it didn't cross over into us. But we invented like some, we invented some great things, and, and you know, so we we have some great inventions that that help modern society that are using today, right? But no, 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 no. Our, I asked you, okay, give me a great feat this century, two thousand and twenty twenty three. What have we done progressively as a people? And if you want to point out an individual, you can do that too. It, it, it that's a good question. It depends on what you define. What's no, your definition? You, you use of your that? definition. Use your definition. <laughs> I don't care what definition you use. Because I can it say because I can say I can say I can say uh people becoming uh black people becoming billionaires. I can say pe- black people uh okay, creating okay, creating okay, okay, their own lane. Okay, I can say hip hop culture. Let's stay with the billionaire. Let's okay. stay with the billionaire since you brought up the billionaire. Yeah. Which I think is the worst thing to bring up, but you okay. brought up the billionaire. Okay. So I want you to tell me how has Oprah, mm-hmm. Jay Z, mm-hmm. Puffy, Kanye, mm-hmm. Bob Johnson, and I'm missing a few. Michael Jordan, yeah. LeBron James, mm-hmm. Tyler Perry. How have them becoming billionaires benefited Black America? Well, see, you didn't frame the question in that way. I didn't say it benefited all of us, but it was an individual I say, effort. I didn't, say, I didn't say it had to benefit <laughs> every single person. Systemically, what have they done with their billions? How did them becoming billionaires benefit Black America? So, if you do something for the for the for the few, it doesn't matter. That's tokenism. So, so tokenism if, 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 if Oprah true. sends 30, 40, 50, whatever however many people to the college you see in a year, whatever the case may be, whatever they brag about, whatever you know, the charity, the, the you know, the philanthropy that they do throughout the world, throughout the community, that doesn't matter. Let me give you a little bit of education. Mm-hmm. Handouts are not solutions. Let me give you an example. At the end of his term, Barack Obama commuted the sentence of hundreds of federal felons. At the end of his term, Donald Trump commuted the sentence of hundreds of federal felons. Donald Trump let Little Wayne off. 
Donald Trump let Kwame Kilpatrick, the black mayor of Detroit, off, right? Mm -hmm. yep. Kodak yes, he black. Did. Okay. Hundreds of black people got out of jail. More white mm -hmm. people than black, but hundreds of black people got out of jail. That was not a solution. That was a handout. You know why it was not a solution? Because it did not systemically change anything about mass incarceration. Mm. You can't point a token or a handout. It's like Barack Obama becoming president. That's tokenism. That doesn't systemically affect black people. You understand? Barack Obama letting a few hundred black people out of jail. That doesn't systemically affect the mass incarceration system against black people. So you can't use Oprah sent a couple thousand black kids to college. Why didn't Oprah use that money and give it to them so they could open up a black business? She gave money to a white college so black kids could get an education. Why didn't she give the child the money themselves and say, go open up a business? Maybe because she, they have the same perspective that you have. I give them that money, they're going to blow it. They're going to put it back in the No, economy. no, that's not why she didn't do it. The reason she sent them to college is everybody knows college alone changes nothing for black people. Mm. We have over 2 million black people with master's degrees who can't find a job. That's why LeBron James sent thousands of kids to college, because it's no threat. It changes nothing. But guess what? That $100,000 you spent, $200,000 you spent on that child to go to college, you could have took that money and opened up a business for that child. Now, that's a problem. The white power structure don't want black celebrities empowering everyday black people. That's a problem. America has decided that the black man and the black woman must be poor, broke, disenfranchised. So to have black celebrities empowering young black children to open their own businesses, that's a problem. Sending them to college. All you're doing is making white colleges richer. You ain't empowering the damn thing. It's definitely a hustle. When That's are we it. going to get serious? It's definitely what? It's definitely a hustle, uh, college. It's um, a hustle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's I, I, I didn't encourage my kids to go to college. I'm going to be honest. I, I, <laughs> do you see what the solution is? I told my son, go to trade school. Go get you a trade. Go get you a trade. You know, electricity, you a trade. HVAC, something like that. You know, carpentry. Go get a trade, man. You'll eat. Just fine, and you can start a business. So yeah, that that's facts because the tuition is astronomical, <laughs> and there's and been documentaries. Know, just like I know that yeah. the average black kid who go to college is never going to get a return on their investment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say this to you, my brother, mm -hmm. and I mean every word of this. You might be better off mm -hmm. taking that two hundred thousand dollars to Atlantic City. <laughs> think about this for a minute <laughs> okay if you take okay. that $200,000 to Atlantic City and gamble you might make a million but if you send your child to college $200,000 so they can get a degree in grasshopper reproduction brother they're not going to get a return on their investment and guess what while them student loans is accumulating Interest is accumulating. So it started out as a $200,000 loan. By the time they paid it off, they didn't give Uncle Sam a half million dollars for an education that they couldn't even find a job with. Yeah, College they, they, is a scam. They make the documentaries about this shit. Yeah. So, yeah. but I will say this. How do you feel about when people say if a, if a child does want to go to college or whatever the case, Go do something in STEM rather than arts or rather than, you know, the, you know, you, 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 you see what I'm saying? The, the, the degrees that people go STEM, for that are the easy better. ones. STEM will be better. There's yeah. also more racism in the STEM programs, too. And mm. what I mean by there's more racism in the STEM programs. A lot of black students are routinely denied an opportunity at a STEM major for low placement test scores. They use placement test scores to deny black children careers in the STEM program. That's how they do to keep us out. Whenever they want to keep black people out of something, they come up with a racist test. We score low, and that justifies keeping you out. Are you saying that black people are 
genetically predisposed to being more dumber than white people? Absolutely not. I'm saying white people are genetically predisposed to be racist and they specifically engineer the tests that they give us to be culturally biased. So it produces a less than accurate representation of your true level of ability and potential. The tests are designed to discriminate against blacks. I know because I give them for a living. Mm. That's the it. test is the new Jim Crow. You want to deny black people an opportunity, give them a test, make sure they score low on it, and there you go. They've been cut out more effectively than if you even put up a sign that said no Negroes. But, how do you think they've how do you think they've denied us opportunities these 55 years since Dr. King? How do you think they kept us where we are? They need an excuse to justify it. How do you justify so few black police in a predominantly black city? How do you justify so few black CEOs, so few black lawyers, so few black doctors? You know how you justify it? They fail the test. And who made the test? White folks. Yeah, but uh, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm wrestling with this one. Fact. I'm wrestling with this one right now, Umar. any in that you want. Your problem, my brother, is you fail to understand mm -hmm. that tests can be designed to produce any in that you want. Tests are not fair. Tests are not scientific. I need you to understand that. Mm -hmm. You can make a test that the white kids pass, the Chinese fail. You can make a test that the Latinos pass and the Arabs fail. You can make a test that the black kids pass and the East Indians fail. Tests are not objective. They are not scientific. They are not fair. Tests are designed to produce a certain result, my brother. Testing is the biggest scam in the country. So you're saying black kids get a different test than white kids. And, and no, they get the it. same. No, okay, they get the same test. Okay, let me explain it to you. Okay, they get the same test. Mm -hmm. The difference is that the test was standardized on the white child. That's why they call it a standardized test. When a test, whenever you make a test, you have to standardize it. That means you're going to choose a group of children that will serve as the norm. These are the normal children. These are the children who are more than likely to pass this test. Are you with me so far, my brother? Yeah, I'm with you. Every test in America is standardized on white children. That means most white kids will what? They're going to pass it. Thank you. By design, most white children are going to pass it because the test was standardized for them. Do you feel me? So the black child is fighting an uphill losing battle because you're taking a test that was standardized for the white child to pass it. So how do you feel about how do you feel about when they say that children or people who make it to high school level, middle school, elementary that, that are not from America. Let's just say the average African kid that comes from a, a decent home to have, you know, not, you know, they don't come from the ills of society as far as Africa's concerned, that they outperform everybody in America, including the whites. And so do Asians. You know why? Why? Because they overcompensate for the cultural bias. Mm. Okay, they overcompensate, and the argument for the African American is why do I have to overcompensate for the inherent so racism in the test when I built the damn country in the first place? Mm. And then to make matters worse, we let our sons grow up dreaming of rap and basketball. We make yeah. we let our daughters grow up dreaming of singing and dancing. Yeah. The black community does not promote academic excellence. Yeah. Yeah. 
So it's a losing battle on three fronts. Number one, we have a sense of entitlement. America owes us. But isn't it interesting that we think America owes us more than we owe ourselves? How can somebody owe you more than you owe yourself? My mother can't owe me more than I owe myself. My father can't owe me more than I owe myself. My community can't owe me more than I owe myself. The country I live in can't owe me more than I owe myself. But black people are so politically lazy and unaccountable to themselves that they think the government owes them more than they owe themselves. So number one, we got this pathological sense of entitlement that's keeping us behind. So we never work hard. That's number one. Number two, the entire structure of academia is racist against black people and black children. That's number two. They intentionally miseducate our children, intentionally on purpose, so they know they're not going to pass them tests. Because one thing I need you to understand, my brother, when we standardize a test, that means we already give the tests to yeah. certain children to see how they do before the final test is given out. Mm -hmm. Do you know what that means? That means before your daughter took the test, I already knew. What they are, they the already got a barometer for. They already know. Yeah. Okay. They already know. Do you really think racism is going to leave it up to chance? They don't leave nothing up to chance. Everything they do is engineered, brother. The voting is engineered. The elections is engineered. The test is engineered. The laws are engineered. There's nothing left to chance. And then the third issue you got is non-white immigrants who come to America and outperform white folks on their own tests yeah. by overcompensating for the cultural bias. Yeah. Why don't black children overcompensate for the cultural bias? Elaborate on that, because a lot of people may not understand what you're saying when you're saying overcompensating for the cultural bias. Overcompensate means I know this test was designed for white folks, mm -hmm. but my family mm -hmm. sent me to America mm -hmm. with the last penny they earned. Mm -hmm. And they are depending on me to get into Harvard, get into Yale, get into Princeton, get into the University of Pennsylvania and become that surgeon, become that engineer, become that attorney so I can go back to Korea, go back to China, go back to Nigeria, go back to the Congo and improve the quality of life for my entire family. Mm -hmm. Failure is not an option for them. Our children, failure it is an option because they can live off their mother for the rest of their life. They can live off their girlfriend for the rest of their life. The biggest problem we got in the black community is black males are still socialized to value their physical ability above their intellectual capacity. Couldn't deep, Uma. Black deep. men are valued for their physical output. That's how it was in slavery, and that's how it is today. Slavery. How did they determine your value on the plantation? How strong you were, how long you could work, how resistant you were to disease. How do they value you today, LeBron James? How do they value you today, Steph Curry? How do they value you today? How high you can jump, how good you can shoot that ball, how healthy you can remain in season. It's no different than the plantation. The only difference between 21st century slaves and 17th century slaves is 21st century slaves get paid. 17th century slaves knew they were slaves. Yeah, you couldn't deep, bro. Yeah, you couldn't deep on that. That that shit, that was all facts. <laughs> I can't I can't argue with you on that one right there. You hit it right on the head. So my how brother, do nothing we... has changed since slavery mm. except the appearance of it. Nothing has we, changed. We got assets now. Slavery except the appearance of it. Mm. They have taken slavery 
and they have covered it up with social media. They have covered it up with a cell phone. They have covered it up with a college education. They've covered it up with a house in the white suburb. They've covered it up with a couple of token Negroes in government positions, and you think you're free. Here's the definition of freedom. To what extent do Black people have the right to dictate their destiny unencumbered by white racism? And has that ability changed at all since 1865? I would argue it has not. I would argue you are just as enslaved today as you were then, but you are distracted by the technological generation. And the distractions is what gives you the illusion of freedom. Twitter, YouTube, video games, internet, laptop, cell phone, you have the white man's toys. And because you are allowed to own the white man's toys, you mistake his toys as being suggestive that you enjoy the same freedom that he does. And nothing could be further from the truth. So when white people say we all slaves, they lying. What do you mean by that? I, I've, I've had, you know, some conversations with white people and, and they would say, hey, man, uh, we all slaves now. It's, it's, you know, we all we all we all are, are victims of the system. Big brother, white, the big brother, uh, the financial systems, the, the oligarchs of the world. We're all victims. We're all slaves. Mortgages, rent, uh, bills every day. You got to get up and go to work every day. We're all slaves. That, that's the that's the rhetoric I hear a lot of white people speak. OK, white people may be slaves to capitalism. Mm. You are a slave to white supremacy. Mm. What is the difference between a white person being a slave to capitalism and black people being a slave to white supremacy? The difference is the white person could change their economic situation. They can go to college and become a surgeon, a dentist, an engineer, a doctor, move up in tax bracket, and improve their life. They're still under capitalism, but they're enjoying more opportunities of it because they have the ability to change their economic level. You cannot change the color of your skin. You cannot change the race that you belong to. So whether you become a doctor, it don't matter. Whether you become a lawyer, it don't matter. Whether you become a surgeon or an engineer, it don't matter because you are black forever. And that is exactly why, my brother, racism likes to indict poverty instead of racism for Black America's problems. If you ever listen to them talk about the reasons why we are in the condition we're in, they, the government loves to talk about poverty. They don't like to talk about the racism. You know why? You can pull somebody out of poverty. You can never pull a black person out of racism. Facts. We can't hide how we look. Whether we're LGBTQ or regular or not, you, you, you still black. I, I, I understand that. That is a fantastic point. But what about the black people that say that I'm black? What about the black people that come from other parts of the world? You know, we can say in Africa, we can say the Caribbean, we can say uh the south america whatever the case may be they say hey man i look black but i ain't black okay so where did they come from because <laughs> guess what because guess what yeah jamaica has a start date mm -hmm. it wasn't around before slavery mm -hmm. brazil has a start date mm -hmm. it wasn't around before slavery mm -hmm. puerto rico has a start date it wasn't around before slavery texas has a start date. Mm -hmm. Pennsylvania has a start date. North Carolina has a start date. Mm -hmm. Illinois has a start date. Canada has a start date. England has a start date. It wasn't around mm -hmm. in ancient times. So what were you before mm -hmm. that land was called Puerto Rico? What were you 
before that land was called Jamaica. Not only what were you, where were you? Let me say this to you, my brother. There were six stages in the evolution of man from primitive man to Homo sapiens sapien, which is what you and I are. Homo sapiens sapien is current man, modern man. Are you following me so far? I am. I am. Yep. All six stages in the evolution of modern man, all six stages of man evolved on the continent of Africa. Let me say it one more time. There were six stages in the evolution of modern man. All six of those stages, those transformations, those evolutions took place on African soil. That means the first man was African. The second man was African. The third man was African. The fourth man was African. The sixth, the, the fourth man was African, the fifth man was African, and we're the sixth. Homo sapiens sapiens. No other continent has all six stages. They may have two of six, they may have three of six, they may have one of six, and if I'm not mistaken, America only has one of six. Do you know what that means? <laughs> that I means do. no one came to America until there was a homo sapien sapien are you with me i'm with you that is to say mm -hmm. that any negro telling you they don't come from an africa is an idiot because you don't find the six stages in the evolution of man outside of africa only in africa do you find all six stages of modern man that means we left africa and came to america that means we left Africa and went to the Caribbean. That means we left Africa and went to Europe. That means we left Africa and went to Asia. We left Africa and went to the South Pacific. Mm -hmm. Mankind was born in Africa and mm -hmm. not just modern man. All six of the stages of modern man was born in Africa. Any Negro who tell you he's not African is a fool. Yes, we were in America before the white man. Yes, we were already here, but we came here from Africa. And if anybody disputes that, they got to show me all six stages of man in America. You can't do it because man did not originate in America. You can't do it. Man did not originate in America. Man originated in Africa, period, point blank, end of story. Science agrees. I mean, I mean, regardless of the history that people know as far as, uh, you know, speaking to, you know, the, the ancient folks of Africa, but science even agrees with that. Science actually came out and said. But see, here's the problem, about, my brother. Yeah, go ahead. When you're dealing with the Negro being consciousness, yeah. we're dealing with the Negro. See, the Negro being says, I don't care what science says. I don't yeah. care what the proof is. Yeah. The Negro being says, I don't want to be an African. So I'm going to come up with a whole bunch of phony ass theories. I'm going to invent some excuse in my mind to convince myself that I'm not African, even though my skin is African, my hair is African, my DNA is African, my chromosomes are African, my ancestry is African, but I don't want to be an African. So I'm going to invent some kind of theory in my mind that allows me to escape being an African. Somebody just sent me an article today. Okay. And they use my word in this too. So I'm going to have to get on them because people are always stealing my ideas. <laughs> Listen okay. to this. Yeah. Listen to this. Yeah. Huffington Post. Indigenous Voices. January 5th, 2023. A Wisconsin activist was just accused of faking their indigenous identity. Pretendians, not Indians. Pretendians. This is a Dr. Umar word, by the way. People are always stealing my stuff. Remember, I invented unapologetically African. I invented unapologetically black. Those Fact. are mine. Fact. Those are mine. Everybody stole and ran with it. Fact. Pretendians are undermining people who actually need a platform in hurting the legitimacy of all indigenous movements. Let me tell you what this is. And I predicted this. 
these black folks, these Africans who are running around calling themselves Indians, they are now going to have to fight against the other Indians, the real Native Americans. They're going to have to fight against them mm -hmm. because the real Native Americans see black people who consider themselves to be Native Americans. They see them as a threat mm -hmm. to their right to fight for resources due exclusively to Native Americans. Are you following me? Yes. So all these Native American Negroes, these pretendians, they now have to fight the real Indians because they feel that black people are encroaching on their rights. Hmm. See, what a lot of these pretendians don't understand, my brother, is some of these Native American kingdoms that they claim they belong to hmm. were slave owning kingdoms. The yes. Cherokee owned slaves. They did. The Chickasaw owned slaves. The they Choctaw did. owned slaves. The yes. Seminoles owned slaves. Yes. So when you say I'm Seminole, what were you, a Seminole slave? And how is being a Seminole <laughs> slave any better than being a white man slave? See, our people are not educated, my brother. They don't want to be black, and they listen to these idiots on YouTube who have no education, have done no firsthand original research. They just regurgitate other people's material. And because nobody wants to be black, the first theory that they hear that gives them an excuse not to be an African, they take it, they claim it, they run with it. Yeah, I mean, um, so you know, you know, there was always this this quote that used to float around in the black communities and things. They look at your hair, they look at your skin tone, and you got a reddish skin tone. You got some red tint to your hair. They say you got Indian in your blood, right? So exactly. <laughs> so if you have fine hair, right? If you yeah. have fine hair, yeah. you are Native American, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, guess what? I can take you to Africa and show you kingdoms in Africa where their brothers and sisters have a red tint to their skin. Mm -hmm. I can take you to kingdoms in Africa where brothers and sisters have yellow skin, but no white blood in their body at all. Mm. I can take you kingdoms in Africa where everybody has the fine, thin, curly hair that black women spend $30 billion a year on mm. with no white blood in their body. Yeah. Let me tell you, every human phenotype has its origin in Africa. Every human phenotype, because we are the mothers of humanity. The East Indian phenotype was originally an African phenotype. The Asiatic phenotype was originally an African phenotype. The Native American phenotype, the Mexican phenotype. You can literally go to Africa and find Africans who look like every race around the world because we are the mothers and fathers of every race. That's a fact. I've seen it. I've world. never been to Africa, but I've seen those phenotypes. And I'm like, wow, them motherfuckers look Asian. They dark skinned. <laughs> they look, yes. They look like they yes. Look. I can't remember the name of the tribe See, in Africa. Here's the issue. Yeah. Here's the issue. Yeah. The so called Negroid type, which is what I am, right? Yeah. The nappy, kinky hair, mm -hmm. broad nose, the Negroid type, which I proudly am is the predominant type in West Africa. Mm -hmm. The white man initially came where? West, West Africa. Africa. So he assumed when he showed up on the Gold Coast, which is what they originally called Ghana, the white man assumed when he came to Senegal, he assumed when he came to Benin and Togo in Nigeria and Sierra Leone, mm -hmm. he assumed that everybody in Africa look like the West African, but the West African only represents one phenotype of the African family. There are many different phenotypes mm -hmm. of the African family. So he made an assumption that was incorrect. And here we are 500 years later, still running with the slave master's assumption about what African people are supposed to look like. Yeah. Um, a lot of people forgot about Cheddar Man. You know about that, right? No, who Cheddar Man? Cheddar Man is the the remains of bones that they found in a cave in Europe, and they did ran the DNA. He was a black man with blue eyes, long streaky hair. So, <laughs> and they 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 rated him to be at least thirty thousand years old when they found they found him in a cave. They called him Cheddar Man. You should look that up. Uh, and they showed him to like a white family. They're like, you want to see your ancestor? <laughs> Wow. Like this white dude sitting I'm there. I'm gonna show you. We're gonna show you what your ancestor looked like. Said he was expecting to look to get a white dude, right? So when they showed him, his DNA showed he was dark skin, long streaky hair, blue eyes. They called him Cheddar Man. You should look that up. Very interesting story. 
<laughs> in the remains. They found a cave in the remains in uh, Europe somewhere, east and west of Europe. But wow. yeah, man. Uh, uh, man, I was going to ask you. Man, but while we at it, before you go to your next question, let me remind all your listeners, please hit the Cash App and support the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy. Get on your Cash App, dollar sign FDMG School. I repeat, dollar sign FDMG School on the Cash App. There's a lot of phony Cash Apps out there, so make sure you got the right one. If you're not sure if you have the right one, you can text my cell phone. Again, you can text my cell phone at 215-989-9858. Two one five nine eight nine nine eight five eight for my PayPal Africans and my international Africans. Hit the PayPal, which is FDMG Academy on PayPal. PayPal.me slash FDMG Academy. PayPal.me slash FDMG Academy. You can also go to drumarjohnson.com and access the donation links there. You can text me for the donation links. 215-989-9858. If you want to mail your check or money order, make that payable to FDMG Academy, P.O. Box 9634. That's P.O. Box 9634, Wilmington, Delaware, 19809. Also, to let brothers and sisters know where I will be at, God willing, uh, to start the new year off, I will be in Brooklyn, January the 12th, to celebrate Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad's Earth Day, the late great leader of the new Black Panther Party who passed away in the year 2001. So please come on out to Brooklyn. That will be next Thursday, uh, the 12th in Brooklyn. Baltimore, Maryland, February the 1st. Washington, D.C., February the 5th. St. Simons Island in Georgia, February the 11th. Las Vegas, Nevada, February the 18th. Grambling, Louisiana, February the 28th. Calumet City, Illinois, March the 22nd. Terra Hawk, Indiana, March the 23rd. Memphis, Tennessee, April the 3rd. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, April the 8th. The Island of Carousel, April the 14th. Pleasantville, New York, April the 21st. St. Louis, Missouri, April the 29th. The Island of Martinique, May the 19th. Mm. Morehouse, Georgia, May the 21st. Durban, South Africa, May the 22nd. The Island of Aruba, May the 28th. Nat Turner Lane, Virginia, August the 21st. King That's Kong Consciousness. King Kong Consciousness in the building, man. Thank you for being here with us, man. Um, this, no was, uh, this, was, this was something that I really look forward to, and I hate that we had the technical issues that we had before. I, I, uh, <laughs> but thank you for this, man. And um, I enjoyed it, man. I enjoyed I, it. I, I, I enjoyed you, man, and I, you know, and I support you, man. And, and um, I, I do understand, um, not on your level, but how it can be. Uh, you can be a controversial figure, and people may not like the moves that you're making and the things that you do and the rhetoric that you spill. But I, I can appreciate the fact that you stand on your square. You've not wavered. You, you, you stand ten toes down, regardless of the pressure. Regardless of the criticism, regardless of the nonsense, you've always been a steadfast person. You've always been very consistent with your message, and I can respect that. And like I said before, I'm going to repeat myself. Um, if your school was here today and I had school-age children, I would send my kids to your school. I really would. You know what I'm saying? Because um, you're speaking the things that we need to hear. And um, everybody has this thing where, Black folk can't be proud to be black folk, but everybody else can be proud to be their folk. And that doesn't mean mm-hmm. if we're proud to be who we are, that we're against you. We got Nobody has anything against you. I don't feel that a white person or Asian person is proud to be Asian is a strike against me. So this world should not take that as a strike against them if black folk is just proud of being black folk and we want to be trained, educated, talk, motivated, and supported by one another. Which is why I wanted to bring you on this show. I speak about I speak about a lot of controversial issues on this show. I speak about the streets. I tell young men get their asses out in the streets, change your life, go get a job, start a business, do something with your life. Because I understand exactly what you look at and what you see, but you are more able to articulate that better than I am. You understand the psychological ramifications of what we've been through in this country, and it's still affecting us today. Which is why we kill each other the way we do which is why we hate each other the way we do, which is why we hurt each other the way we do. Uh, you know, I, I understand that, which is why I wanted to talk to you about that. So my message is always going to be anybody that listens to this channel, you know, I always preach positivity, 
prosperity and get your ass away from that nonsense, man. And 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 yeah. really focus on something and really focus on something to do something with your life because it can be right. gone at the blink of an eye. And people like Umar Johnson and a lot of people who speak like him, who talk like him, who think like him are underappreciated in our society. And we need to raise these people up because they are pillars in our society. We shouldn't wait for a person's demise to love them. We shouldn't wait for a person to fall short to love them. We should appreciate them, give them their flowers while they're alive, appreciate and build them up while they're alive, not when they're gone, not when they're in the afterlife, not when they're with their ancestors, because it's easy to love them then because they're not here. Right. It's easy to love them then. They're not here anymore. So this is why I wanted to bring this brother here. I knew, I told y'all, my audience, I told y'all, this is going to be a controversial interview. This is a controversial brother, and I held it away from y'all for a reason. And, and I, I hate wanted... that word controversy. <laughs> I hate it because... I'm sorry. I mean, I don't mind you using it. I don't mind you using it. Uh, yeah. but I'm saying this contextually, not towards you. But the reason I say I hate that word is... I'm not controversial. I just tell the truth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You, you feel me? From yeah. my perspective, I just tell the truth. You know? Yeah. White teachers shouldn't be teaching black kids. That's not controversial. That's the truth. ADHD is a scam. That's not controversial. It's the truth. Mm. Uh, black people are lazy and don't want to solve their own problems. That's not controversial. That's just the truth. Mm. It's just that we live in a world where people don't tell the truth anymore. Yes. People don't tell the truth. And a lot of people don't have the courage. Mm to tell the truth and suffer the alienation that comes from telling the truth. Mm. I don't have that problem. Mm. You, you follow what I'm saying? I yeah. don't have that problem. I'm yeah. not weak, weak minded like that, where I need people to agree with everything. Now, some people, they're not going to say it unless everybody agrees with them. Mm. You know, they only going to say things that people like it, not me. I was not sent into this world to entertain black folks. I am the spirit of Marcus Garvey, the spirit mm. of Mike Turner, the spirit of Gabriel Prosser, the spirit of John Jacques Dessalines. Those men didn't come here to play no games. They came here to liberate people no matter who liked it or didn't like it, including the people themselves. That's the energy I walk with. I could care less what somebody got to say about me. Thanks, man. And um, man, I appreciate it, man. I, like I said, I knew it was going to be, a, you know, one of those things where there was going to be some people that's got some adverse reactions, man. I don't, I don't, care. I don't, I don't care. I don't care, man, because I don't care. people like this need to be heralded in our community because controversial or dramatic or whatever people who stand for theirs in other communities, they're, her they're held as heroes. They, they're put on pedestal. They got statues for them people, bro. Still standing today. Who stood, who stood on their rhetoric, however they felt about whatever other race of people. So we need to understand one thing and one thing only, man. We are a multifaceted people, and we cannot expect for all of us to be a monolith and to think the same. Some folk out here really give a fuck about us, bro. Regardless of how you feel they deliver it, they care. And in order to care, you got to put yourself, especially in the society, sometimes in harm's way. You got to do it. You understand? What I'm you gotta, you gotta be a controversial figure. And I know, I know the brother the Umar don't like controversy, but you gotta be a truth teller. And when you're a truth teller, the drama, rhetoric, uh, uh, you know, defectors, they're gonna come your way, and they're gonna do everything they can to knock you yeah, off that's, your that's, mission. That's, yeah, that's that's like, you know, that's like it ain't even really worth mentioning for me. You, you mm. feel me? Because. I've dealt with that the whole 12 years that I've been the biggest name in the world in black consciousness. And see, that's why I don't like giving the negativity too much attention. I don't focus on it because, okay, I just named you just to give you an example. And I'm not bragging. I'm just, I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. I have 20 invitations. What's today's date, my brother? It's the 9th. No, January 6th. Well, Today is the 6th day of the year, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The 6th day of the year, and I already have 20 invitations to speak. Yeah. And four of those invitations are in different countries. So that's 
20 invitations, five different countries in the world. Nobody else in the black conscious community has that. It's only January 6th. And I've already been invited to speak in five different countries. You see, so I don't pay none of this. No, mind. I am unprecedented. Never before in the history of this country has a black scholar got the type of love, support, international following that I got. Black people love Dr. Umar. So I don't even pay attention to a couple broke down, you know, no life having Negroes who got something negative to say. I'm the I mean, shit. I mean, I'm, I'm just going to keep it real, my brother. Yeah. I'm just going to keep it a You're going to have your shit. perspective. Yeah. Like, you know, like, like I don't, I don't believe, I don't block yeah. people from my comment section. You know, you can nah, say, I believe up. in freedom of, no, freedom of speech. You got no, no, freedom of speech. You can say whatever you I want. I don't care. But this ain't for you. I never asked for that. I never asked for that. You know, you just block them for what? Block. They not that important to be blocked. Let them. Let them have their fun. Negroes need to have fun too, my brother. Let them have their fun. I ain't got no issue with that. But my point is, I think sometimes though the interviewee, the interviewers, yeah. I do think sometimes y'all give too much attention to the negativity. You, you, I, I really think y'all do to the you point so? where people. Did yeah, I, I'm not I saying tonight? you per se. <laughs> you know, I'm not saying you per okay. se, but okay. you know they 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 talk about people don't like them. How people don't like them? There's yeah. nobody bigger than me in the world. How do people don't like them? How? You, you see what I'm saying? The love, I, I think y'all need to pay more attention to the love. I think I spend so much attention on the negativity. Talk about the love. Talk about the fact he the first person in the history of this country to open up a school that was built by the African diaspora. Talk about that. You know, talk about the love Dr. Umar gets. Nobody gets the love I get. Nobody. Nobody. But we always talk about these haters. Y'all make them too important by giving them too much attention. Look at all the love I get. Pay it. Yeah. Focus on that. We go to the negativity. We got to get out of that. That's part of that Willie Lynch. That's part of that mm -hmm. European mind control. We always focusing on the negative. Focus on the positive. Focus on the people who love me. They yeah. far outweigh the people who don't. That's all I'm saying. The people who love Dr. Umar all Definitely. over the world far outweigh the detractors. In the new year, I want us to start focusing on support. Focus on the supporters and stop highlighting haters. Definitely. It's more love in the chat than hate. I'm not tripping on anything. I do the same thing on my channel. I get a lot of hate too. So and I, you know, I tell my people, don't block nobody. Just let them let them let them, let them flow. We're gonna use let that as flow. we're gonna, we're gonna use that as motivation. We're gonna use that as motivation. Yeah, let them flow. Let them yeah, flow. Let them we flow. don't have to keep talking about them though. You feel me? Let yeah. them flow, but we ain't gotta keep it. I got you, man. Thank yeah, you. We ain't gotta keep it dressed. Thank you, Dr. Umar Johnson, man, for blessing me, man. For, for this no interview, problem, man. man. Like, good conversation. You good made conversation. you made a way to get here out of your busy schedule to come to my small ass YouTube channel and have a mm -hmm. conversation with Getty Radio, man. This is going down in history. I'm going to archive this, even the the technical issues. <laughs> I feel like, so, yeah, I feel like somebody's against me good. right now. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> but it turned out great, man. Thank you for being so candid. Thank you for being so honest. And thank you for being the person um, that I've always saw you be in interviews, man. You know what I'm saying? So you didn't change the energy. Everything was beautiful. Everything was great. Um, uh, 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 I got thrown off a little bit because I was trying to get my new computer together. I, sh I maybe I shouldn't have done that because I was flustered a little bit. But nah, it came out all right. It came out all right. Thank you know you. what? One thing I wanted to tell the audience, if I could, yeah, go ahead. Uh, make sure you guys go to drumar.tv and subscribe. Uh, I don't know if you know this, brother Getty, but drumar.tv. We're gonna we're gonna drop the link in the chat. Hold on, let me uh give me the link right quick. Yeah, www. www. Dot okay. D R U M A R dot TV www dot dot D R U M A R dot TV. Yeah, it's a, a video on demand site that I have, and I'm working on a new series, Black America since Dr. King. Okay, this, I got it. www dot Dr. You got it. Dr. Dot TV. TV. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, we're gonna pin this. We're gonna, right this now, the, we're gonna pin the link in the chat. Um, you guys yeah. hit that link, man, and, and rock, rock rock out with the brother. Um, yeah. So let, the me, let me let me give a little background. Let me, go ahead, hold, on, hold on. Let me give a little background. Getting. Give a quick little background. 
the new series that I'm working on is uh, called Black America Since Dr. King. And so what I'm doing is I'm taking us from 1965, which is the year they killed Malcolm. And I'm coming all the way up to 2013. And I'm giving my analysis, narrative, and interpretation from a Garveyite Pan-Africanist perspective. Mm -hmm. The reason I'm doing Black America Since King is I need Black people to understand that the circumstances and situations under which we live today are not an accident. We got where we are because of deliberate engineering by the white power structure and deliberate abandonment of the Black community towards our own agenda. We gave up on ourselves at the same time the white power structure began to put their foot on our neck even more. And so I'm going to show you that the black on black crime, the gangster rap, the snow bunny crisis, mm. all these problems we have, we played a role in them and they were intentionally created by the white power structure to destroy our people. So I've already got three of them up. I did 1965, 1966. 1967, 1968, 1969, and I'm about to do 1970. We coming all the way up. We so they're on demand. Six. Yes, on demand. You can either subscribe, which is $9.99 a month. You can mm -hmm. watch as many videos as you want, or you can pay $4.99 to rent each video. So it's cheaper to just subscribe and get $9.99 a month. That way it's unlimited, or you can just rent it for $4.99. I love this but, and shit like that. Yeah, it's powerful, though, and it's coming from a Garvey perspective. Mm. And um, I think it for anybody who really wants to understand why we are where we are, mm. I think this this uh, Dr. Um, uh, Black America since Dr. King will be a good start for them. So make sure y'all go to www.drumar.tv and check out the videos. TV. It's in the, the link is in the chat, family. Y'all support, man. Umar, thank you so much, bro. No Once problem, again, bro. Great, great talk. Hey, no we problem. gotta do this when again. Done, man. Send me the link so I can post it for you. All I right, got you. We done. gotta do this again. I'm gonna edit it. <laughs> I'm, I'm, okay. I'm gonna get okay, the bullshit no out, and then, uh, then I'm gonna send you the link of the standalone video. I'm gonna have to get the clutter and the cannon fodder out of the bullshit out of there, man. You know what I'm saying? So we can be clean. Because yeah. it did clean up after a while, you know. It, 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 for some reason, the program won't act right, but the audio is crispy clear for the past uh, hour 20, hour 30. We So we, we had clear uh, on my side. Your side was always I clear. But yeah, I'm going to send it to you, brother. Appreciate you. No problem. Be Have safe, a good you. one, baby. Appreciate it. All right, bro. All right. Hey, that was brother Dr. Umar Johnson, 